before the pitching session, special guest here today, we have a keynote speech from Gary Whitehill, founder of Burst and Entrepreneur Week. Please, Gary. Welcome, Gary. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, Gary is going to talk about a very sensitive topic, which is how to raise capital from investors for your startups. Very important. Thanks, Gary. Good afternoon, everybody. So it's a little bit of a sensitive topic, I agree as well. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about how to be a one, percent, uh, one percenter. How do you actually build a presentation that is in the top one percent? So this is kind of what startup like is like, right? You, you have your blinders on, you're in myopia, you're trying to build a company, and the last thing in the world that you have time to think about or invest time in is spending three months and figure out how to present. So it's my job to teach you how to do that in the next 20 minutes. So we're gonna condense three months into 20 minutes. So the statistics, just so we can start out and be very realistic around um, what the statistics are around a successful startup. Every year, 432 million entrepreneurs attempt to start 305 million companies, of which only 100 million of them actually start. And out of those 100 million, out of only one in a thousand actually become sustainable. So if you're looking to raise money, keep this in mind. Not only is it hard to build a presentation that's clear and concise, those are the statistics of you getting funding in the first place. So if you want to stack the odds in your favor, that's what we're going to go over today. So I think Steve had this right, right? Your time is really limited. So if you're going to build something, build something that you're passionate about. Because if you're not passionate about it and irrational in terms of the amount of effort you're willing to put in, there's no way you're going to be successful. The problem is being passionate is not tangible. It's this little foo-foo-y thing that everybody says, let's be passionate about building a company. But what does that tangibly mean? How do you exude passion in a presentation in order to raise funding? which is what we're gonna talk about here today. So a little bit about my background. Um, I scaled a company to four continents in two years. It's called Entrepreneur Week. And I was curious, um, since, 19, since 1850, how many people have actually scaled a company globally? So my team did a little bit of research, and in the past 164 years, less than 1,000 companies have scaled globally. So what we're gonna go over here today is the success, the successful presentation and structure that I gave that enabled us to do what less than a thousand people have done in the past 164 years. So this is your roadmap, right? Once again, passion goes under hopes and dreams. You want funding and in the middle is how you achieve your future. The problem is very few people actually know how to get the funding. So if you actually could take on the world and get whatever you wanted, what would that look like? Well. What that's gonna look like is you present and try and raise money is something like this, right? The challenge in presenting is that you have to be very succinct, but you also have to exude your impact on the market simultaneously. Usually entrepreneurs are good at one or the other. It's very easy to discuss impact. It's very hard to be succinct. It's very easy to not be succinct and discuss impact. So what we're gonna do here today is discuss how we can get you up into the top right. What that journey looks like is this, pie chart. So the first stage we're gonna talk about is preparation, which is the no excuses that you need to have when you decide that you want to raise money. What is your mentality? How do you think? How do you prepare yourself? Because if it was easy, everybody would do it, but it's not easy. The second stage is execution, right? Luck is an accumulation of superior effort and focused execution. The business that you are trying to build is not something that's gonna build itself. So we're gonna talk about how you articulate a business that actually deserves funding in the first place. And the last two steps we're gonna talk about is stacking the deck, right? So a lot of the people who get funded, it's not just because they know what they're doing, it's not because they just have a good company, it's they figured out some interesting tips that most people don't use of how to stack the deck in their hand. So we're gonna discuss those tips too and hopefully get you on your way in less than 20 minutes. So the first part of being an entrepreneur and raising money, it's a battle. It's not something that's very easy. It's not easy to be humble yet confident. 
It's not easy to be cool yet collective. And so what you need to do when you're an entrepreneur raising money is be prepared. Because at the end of the day, you are not ready to raise money. I have never met one person who's going out to raise money that's actually ready to raise money. You never are. Unless you're willing to dedicate three months, three months to doing it, there's never, ever enough time to do it. You're never going to be ready, and that's okay. And if you come from that core assumption that you're not ready, you're gonna be much more open and willing to do the things that you need to do to raise the money that you wanna raise. The biggest problem folks have when trying to raise money is they overcomplicate things. Instead of saying, we believe in X, we build X because of X, you try to talk about what it is. Well, it does this, which means this, and does that, and your 30 second pitch turns into five minutes. Your 15 second pitch turns into one minute. Unfortunately, in my experience, as I've been investing in companies around the world, most entrepreneurs don't understand how to precisely and concisely articulate their value proposition, where they're going in the market, and how the investors are actually gonna get their value back. You get caught up in actually what the business does, but the, the investor doesn't care just about what the business does, the investor cares about how they're gonna get their money back and make a return. So we're gonna talk about some do's and don'ts right now from a really, really high level. The first step is you have to bring your A game. As I was talking about, what happens as an entrepreneur is you're so down in the weeds. You know, your head's, your head's below water. The challenge that you have is that you can't see the simplistic core operating principle of the business that you've built. Meaning, why did you build the business? Stop talking about what? Stop telling the five things that it does, the five markets you can go into. Why do you do it? Just why? We believe in helping people do X. It's really that simple. The minute you do something more than those six words, is the minute you overcomplicate things and you get into minutia. And you start struggling to tell a very concise story that has a very clear value proposition. You always start with why. Simon Sinek, is, has anybody ever heard of Simon Sinek before? Raise your hand. So Simon has a book called Start With Why. Why you do what you do. What's your passion, what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief. If you are very, very clear in what your why is and why you're building your company, the rest is very easy. The problem is very few entrepreneurs step back to understand and clearly articulate that. And that should be the core and the epicenter of your business. When you talk about your business, why you do it needs to be at the center. Not what, not how, not who's involved. So being, co being confident, not cocky. Focus on what the investor needs to hear and know. So what does that mean? Well, the first step is rehearsing. So I was talking to somebody uh, just before in the speaker's uh, lunch, and we were talking about presenting. And I asked her before she raised um, her, her $5 million Series A, how many times did you practice? And she said, oh, I don't know, probably 70 or 80 times. And I said, yeah, the rule of thumb is pr practice 100 times. Before you get up in front of people, you practice 100 times. Before you're ready to pitch in front of investors, 100 times. You don't have to do it all at once. That's something that us entrepreneurs do too. We wait till the last minute for everything. We wait to pay people, we wait to have a plan, we wait to do the right things. But when it comes to raising money, it is not something where you can just take one big leap, like this. It doesn't work like that. You have to take little, 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 little steps that then turn into a big leap, right? And so it's very, very important that you step back and you practice. Practice with your friends, practice with your family, practice with whoever. Do not think three minutes is something you can wing, or five minutes, or 10 minutes. The typical angel presentation is 10 minutes, and 10 minutes of Q&A. Once again, visualize also how you wanna present, right? So do you present like this? Do you present like this? Are you animated? Do you use your hands? You know, for instance, I don't like using a mic like this. The reason why is because I can't use my hands. But then if I wanna use my hands, then the mic doesn't work, right? So you have to figure out ahead of time how you wanna present. How can you be engaging to people? Do you wanna look them in the eye? Do you wanna use graphs? What do you wanna do? Determine what to say and how to say it. The best way to garner that feedback, once again, is to practice. Thank you. 
And practice makes perfect. So the only way to build confidence and reassurance is to, exactly, practice. So here's the gears that we're going to run through very quickly through this presentation. This is the roadmap we're going to follow. So how do you articulate the market opportunity and the value proposition of your business to an investor? Stage two, 50 miles an hour, like you would drive in a car, usually the speed limit. You describe the features, the benefits, your intellectual property, and those types of things. And then how do you get to 100 miles an hour? How do you present your SWOT plan, your exit strategy, and actually all the things that the investor cares about? How do you do that, and how can you be very fluid in ramping up from one mile an hour to 100 miles an hour, and then back down? And everything in between, because an angel presentation or a venture capital presentation is not something that just goes on a linear trajectory. It goes from one mile an hour to 50, 50 to 100, sometimes 100 back down to one mile an hour. Sometimes you get interrupted right in the middle, and we're going to talk about how to make sure that, that, that you're able to handle that and gear back down for Q&A. A couple of further do's and don'ts. Use a stopwatch. So when you're practicing, it's worth using a stopwatch. Because the problem is, you can talk all day about your startup. You only have 10 minutes to articulate a lot of stuff. So use a stopwatch. Number two, be passionate. Don't just get up there and talk like this. A lot of people get so nervous that they talk like this. And it's really hard to get engaged in a presentation when you talk like this. Don't talk like that. Talk like this. Animate your voice. Use tone to your advantage. People like that. Benefits are paramount. Once again, don't talk about what you do. Talk about why. Talk about the benefits that are a byproduct of why and that core operating principle of why you have your business. Differentiate. Clearly articulate your competitive advantage. Everybody in the world wants to build a business, but what is going to make you so special that you have at least a year or two years of a competitive advantage for your market to catch up? It's called the efficiency frontier. If you look it up, basically what the efficiency frontier says is the market is here, your proposition is here, what is that trajectory time between here and here? It's important to articulate that to an investor because that trajectory is what's going to mitigate risk. So now we're going to get into the first five minutes of the presentation. First step, make a connection. Investors know within the first minute whether or not you're ready to present. They know whether you're confident enough, they know whether you know what you're doing, and they know whether you're ready to articulate what you're supposed to. Because they know whether you're clear, you're concise, and you're already adding value to their ears. If not, they already tone out. So what does that include? Talk about where the idea came from. Everybody likes a story. It's engaging. Number two. What is the pain you are trying to alleviate in the market? What is the pain? Everybody has a pain. The better visual you can show, the better. Why and how the team is formed, right? So why you built the business we already talked about, but how did the team form? How did they come together? People like to hear that cohesion. And who is involved as well? The problem is that what I just showed you Less than 30% of people do very well. And the reason why is because they don't start with why. They start with what. So make sure, once again, that you start with why. It'll make sure that you move forward and you can delve into what would be your next part, which is OK. A little AV issues here, sorry. Well, I guess we're going to skip that slide because we have AV issues. So um, how do you be a wizard? In your second and third minutes, the way this presentation is broken down is by minute by minute. So we're going to skip from one minute, and we're going to go right into the second and third. Talk about your current pain point. What is the problem, and how is it addressing your target market? The next one, do the, does the target market want it solved, or do they want it avoided? Or do they simply, is it simply an underserved market? Those are three separate ways to talk about a core value proposition from a product and a strategy point of view. And that is a very clear way, once again, to articulate the value of your company. Seriousness of the pain point. What are the implications? So tell a story. Once again, the investors like to hear a story. Tell a story of what happens when you're in the market, with the pain point that you solve, 
what actually happens over time to the consumer? How do they change their behavior? What will that look like down the road? And that is their desired future reality. If it was up to you, what would the consumer's life look like one year, five years, and 10 years from now? Less than 15% of the folks do this right because they don't sit down and think strategically about their user, their, their core value proposition. For whatever reason, they don't start with their product benefits and they don't start with their competition. In minutes two and three of your presentation, you get to the competition first and foremost. The reason why is because the investor, that's their number one challenge with listening to you. How are you able, from a high level, going to be able to enter a market that you've never been in and usurp the competition that's already in there or might be there? So be ready to evolve your business model. One of the things that'll come up in the Q&A section a lot of times is are you willing to evolve your business model? A lot of entrepreneurs uh, are stuck on their business model and answer no to that question. The answer is always yes, because the market moves and consumer, and consumer tastes move. So if you wanna follow the market and be important and make money and get investment, evolve your model. Showing broader impact as well. Explore the macro level implications of your product or service. Does this have an effect on you know, the healthcare industry or is it just affecting consumers at a low level? Meaning, is there law changes that could possibly happen? Is there a way that you can fundamentally restructure the industry that you're going to be a part of? You know, if consumer tastes change over the next five years, is there going to be something new that needs to be implemented to make sure that you're successful or that gives consumers more choice? Embrace the duality. Once again, when you're pitching and you're talking about your competition, it's very easy to talk about why your product and your service is the best thing since sliced bread. But what your investor wants to hear is how you're mitigating risk. So in minutes two and three, while you're balancing back and forth your competition, you have to keep in mind both that you're trying to mitigate risk, but that you're also the best thing since sliced bread. It's not very easy to do, but it can be done. So in the fourth and fifth minutes, you talk about why is your product the best? What is it about the product or service that makes it the best thing since sliced bread? Because investors seek things that are exponentially better. They don't want a linear trajectory of a lockstep innovation in a market. That's not why investors put money into your company. They need a 10 to 20x return within five years. That is not going to come from an from a value proposition that is just one step ahead of the market. It's gonna come from something that's two, three, four, or five steps ahead of where the market is today. And where there's also a two or three to five year trajectory that you have to grow into that business and that consumers can grow with you. One of the mistakes entrepreneurs make that's really easy is not doing enough due diligence on their competitors. You know, it, it's as simple as having somebody, not from your cell phone and not from your company's phone, call up the company and just talking to them, figuring out what they're doing, how they're thinking about things, what products they have in the pipeline. You'd be amazed how few entrepreneurs take such a simple step to understand what their competition is truly doing. Because what happens is most entrepreneurs throw up a graph to an investor and say, well, here's where the competition is. No, that's where the competition was six months ago but now they're iterating on something else. Do a little due diligence, doesn't take much. It's important. The next thing you talk about in the macro is how, you how you're gonna commercialize the business. Number one, talk about being customer centric, right? The best companies in the world are customer centric companies. They are driven by user experience, they're driven by what the customer deems is important to them. The best example of a customer driven company in the world is a company called Nordstrom. The customer is always right, no matter what. They're the most well-known retail store in America. They don't make the most money, but they have the most loyal customer. And the reason why is because the customer is always right. And when you have to evolve your business model and as fast as technology is moving and iterating, the easiest way to continue to be successful in your company is to do exactly this, be customer-centric because customers who are loyal will be a brand champion no matter where you have to wiggle and move as a business. Second, talk intellectual property. What value do you have that you can wrap some property around? 
Is it your team? Is it you have a patent? Is it your time to market? What is it? There's something that makes you special, whether you can file for it like a patent or it's something that's intangible that nobody knows you have. Maybe you just have a really big brain. I don't know, but there's something that makes you really smart. Talk about it. Next in the fourth and fifth minute, this is why preparation is vital, because very few people talk about those three things all in one in those, four, those two minutes. So let's talk about the next five minutes. You have to stay focused. So at a micro level, there's three key issues that most entrepreneurs don't focus on concisely enough. The first, the validity of your venture. So there's a lot of things out there right now, lean startup and all these other ways to validate your business. What other things besides just talking to people have you done to validate your business? Do you have research reports? Do you have folks who've been in the industry for 30 years that can tell an investor that this is where the, the, the industry is going? What is it that validates your business besides just talking to customers? Because customers don't know where the market's going. Customers most of the time don't even know what they need. As Henry Ford said, if people just, if people, people never wanted a car, if I asked them what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. It's a fact. Customers don't know what they want a lot of times. Second, how and when will the investor recoup their money, right? That's how they think. Five to seven years, I need my money back. I need 10 or 20X. Where's that coming from? Make sure you talk about that. Third, how and when will the investor exit? right, for 10 to 15 times, maybe 20 times. So you talk about the timeline and then specifically, hey, Mr. and Ms. Investor, you will get a 15X on this, in this quarter, on this date. Whatever the heck it is, be very precise. Paint a picture for them. Tell a story. So put another way, are you going to do what you say you'll do? It's all about trust. Investors want to be able to trust you. They want to know when they're going to get their investment back. And when will they make some serious money, right? So there's a difference. When will the company start making money? When will I get my investment back? When will I start making money? Those are three separate things. An entrepreneur in a presentation normally only talks about one of them. Talk about all three. So talk dollars and cents. Talk your initial target market. What is the discretionary dollars that your target market has now? What will they have in a couple of years? Also, talk about the total addressable market. So it's one thing to talk about me as a person, how much money I have as a household, but what in general does your target market have, right? So if your addressable market is 100 million people, talk about the disposable income each person has on average and then the addressable market as a whole, on average, what they have as well. Also articulate the multiplier, the grouping of your market. So um, in any market there are super early adopters, early adopters, and then folks who follow the curve, right? The super early adopters are the first 2.5% of people out of 100% that believe in the business that you have. Those are your core champions. Those are the ones who will help you get the next 11% and the next 32%. And it's very important to tell that picture to the investor how you're precisely going after that first 2.5%. What normally happens is somebody gets up and they say, hey, Mr. Investor, each person has a disposable income of $500 a month, and the total addressable market is $500 million a year. But that doesn't tell the story of the fact that my total addressable market up front is these 600 people who make $500 a month. And for the year, that's what, you know, it's $10,000 that they make. Break it down by category of those, uh, those consumers who are gonna be your loyal clients, one after the other after the other. Don't group them all together. So start with customer number one and end with customer million, a million. Going back to the example of Nordstrom, Investors love to hear how you're going to scale from one customer to a million customers. They love to hear the story of how you're going to be customer-centric, whether that's your product, whether that's your service, whether that's your strategy. 
most entrepreneurs will say, here's my business and we're just gonna do cool stuff and you should fund us. Or you can say, here's the business, we're gonna start with that first 2.5%, they each have $500 to spend a month, their disposable income per year is $10,000, and that will get us to about 600 people. Then the next section of folks will get us to 50,000 people. The next section of folks will get us to 500,000 people. And here's all their demographics. Here's the strategy that we're thinking about how to target them. Here's how our product relates to each of those demographics differently. So there's a very big difference, once again, between grouping a million people together and telling a story of one person to 600 to 10,000 to a million people. And the point there is you should walk before you run. When you articulate your competition, you choose one of these three things to point out to an investor. Usually an entrepreneur picks two or three, and it doesn't work out very well. So the first, do you know them inside and out? Clearly articulate that. The best way to do that, like I said, pick up the phone, do some due diligence. The second thing that most entrepreneurs say is, we don't have any competition. Are you serious? Of course you have competition. Never say you don't have competition, because you always do. The third one is, you don't have any direct competition. That's what a lot of other entrepreneurs say, and what that invites is a lot of questions. So uh, any entrepreneur that says they don't have direct competition, that's usually where the investor's mind peaks up, because that's a market opportunity, a niche that either hasn't been explored or has been explored, and has been validated that doesn't work. So it's either one of the two. So have a strategic plan around how you're gonna leapfrog those competitors. Any smart investor knows that they're gonna find the holes. So trying to say to an investor that you don't have competition is not very smart because they're gonna find the holes no matter what. They're not just gonna hand you a check just because you look nice or because your business sounds great. It doesn't work that way. So the ninth minute, the team is key. How do, you, how do you highlight a team that matters? Talk about your specific skills and what makes you successful in this venture in the first place. There are specific core competencies that you have that make you successful. Second, market knowledge. What do you have from a competitive perspective that makes you special? What knowledge do you have that nobody else has that allows you to hone out a niche that nobody else knows about? Third, what leadership skills do you have? Have you been a CEO before? Have you been a product manager at a Fortune 500 company? Tell the story of what you've done and how that relates to building a venture that really matters and how you have a really solid team. Fourth, drive and dedication. You guys ever heard of ramen noodles before? Talk about you're driven and relentless to do anything to make the business work. You're ready to be gritty. Flexibility and the ability to adapt. As we talked about before, you have to have a flexible business. So you have to have a flexible product, you have to have a flexible go-to-market strategy. Make sure you talk about that. Don't be a show-off. Only focus on a hallmark name in your team if they're key. A lot of times the mistake an entrepreneur makes you know, somebody who's made 100 million bucks selling their business, they put them in the core team slide when in reality they're only involved 10% of the time. Make sure you only do that if they're actually part of the core team. The 10th minute, show me the money. In just one minute, you have a lot to cover. This is the last minute of your presentation. You have to cover the investment required. Whoa, technical failure again, sorry guys. your deal structure, your exit strategy, and your summary and your close. In a minute, you have to do all those things. And the reason why that should only be a minute and in your 10th minute is because those are the last things that actually, truly bring it home for the investor. And because it's only a minute, it forces you to be very concise. So here's how you would benchmark yourself in that strategy as well. You talk about one of these three, point, three pair, fair points when you're doing benchmarking to make sure that you get a good valuation. Talk about the multiple to last year's revenues, uh, talk about a multiple to next year's revenues, or talk about competition that's already out there. Then in your recap and close, do the research. Articulate why that group must invest. There must be a strategic reason why that exact group is going to invest in you and your team. 
not just because they have money, but maybe they have specific market knowledge. Maybe they have specific um, strategic partners. Maybe they can make specific introductions. There's one reason or another in that 10th minute that they are important to you and your business, and it's important that you articulate that. So to close, we gotta go through it quick. In the Q&A, investors who ask questions care. Second, investors who don't ask questions have already checked out. So you know in the Q&A whether they've checked out or not. Third, have a top 100 answers prepared beforehand. Brainstorm with your team 100 different things that an investor could ask you in the Q&A. It's the smartest thing you could ever do up front to prepare yourself for whatever the heck they're gonna ask. Break it down 25 questions in operations, 25 questions in what you're gonna do with the money, 25 questions in marketing and branding, and 25 questions in sales. That's the easiest way to make sure you get through things. And last but not least, if you don't have an answer, don't make one up. Investors are going to figure out that you don't know what you're talking about. You're not supposed to know everything. It doesn't work that way. You simply say, I'll get back to you, ma'am or sir. I don't know right now. And that's okay, because that shows that you're confident, and it shows that you're humble. Those are the two things that most entrepreneurs make a mistake. That's all the time we have, guys. I hope you learned something. Thank you very much.